Hi, and welcome to Answers News for Monday, February 8th, 2021. I'm Avery Foley, and I'm here with Brian Osborne and hey Roger Patterson. Hello. Um, we're excited to be with you here today. Got a couple things to start with um, as we wait for people to get on. Uh, first thing I want to mention is Answers TV. Some of you are watching this from Answers TV. If you are Good for you. For those of you who are watching on YouTube and Facebook, get Answers TV and watch on Answers TV. <laughs> um, we encourage you to, to try that out. You can try a seven-day trial for free. Um, there are thousands of different videos on there from conferences to kids programming, nature programming, Roger's amazing science programming. You can see him there as Mr. P blowing things up. Um, there are all kinds of great stuff on there, so I encourage you to, uh, to check that out. Try that seven-day trial. Um, it's only four ninety nine a month or thirty nine ninety nine for the whole year. Yeah. We've got other ministry partners like Wretched That's and right. Living yep. Waters and others mm-hmm. who are uh, bringing content to the platform, so lots of great things for you mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really awesome. And it's so mm-hmm. safe. You can let your two-year-old fish around on Answers.tv, and it's all safe to watch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's pretty great. And you can get it anywhere in the world. So um, oftentimes when you're in Canada, like I grew up, you can't get certain things, <clears throat> but you can get Answers TV in Canada, um, so I encourage you to, uh, to give that a try. Um, and the other thing we want to mention here is our Explore Days and Explore Junior. These are full days of hands-on science education um, where kids get to do uh, like hands-on experiments, hands-on um, different workshops while they get expert instruction from um, different scientists and other experts who have a biblical worldview. So pretty unique. Um, definitely encourage people to, to check that out. That takes place here at the Creation Museum or there's a few of them that take place down at the Ark. Yeah, we've got some great programs. Uh, do. For, like down at the Ark, we get to take the kids in and they got to interact with the sloth up close and personal That's and right. the tortoise and some mm-hmm. really interesting things like Which that. Which is really fun. I got so to you're going to get some great behind the scenes TV. types of things that mm-hmm. you wouldn't get on a normal visit. And they're great ways to uh, supplement education if you're a homeschooler mm-hmm. or even if you're, you have a kid in public school, you could take them out for one of these days to bring them to get some biblical foundation and grounding in a lot of these topics. Mm-hmm. My son Ian, who is seven, just did one of these last week, I think it was, and you were teaching the class, yes. actually, <laughs> in a different teaching did session. Behave. Well, his mom was there. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, his mom was there, so he was on his best behavior. <laughs> but it was so cool because Ian came home and he made a little ticket for me. It said, "Ticket to come see the slime." Love Ian. <laughs> and he had made some slime that had, I think, uh, they did iron oxide slime. inside. It was they magnetic, and so it could, you could stick stuff to it. And he was loving that. He had a oh, great time. Oh, it's so fun. Yep. So fun. Uh, yeah, so be sure to check that out. They, they tend to sell out pretty quickly, so creationmuseum.org slash explore is the place to go. Um, and if you want your kids to have five days of that, um, Explore Camp taking place this summer. We have two weeks of Explore Camp where there's five days of back-to-back science education. Same thing, very hands-on expert instructors, um, a whole host of different subjects. So one different subject every day. So they get to go through a variety of different sciences like astronomy, forensics, um, earth science, things like that. And um, I promise I'll blow something up at least once. <laughs> nice. There we go. <laughs> I mean, that's like my claim to fame now. Roger's yeah. going to come and blow something up for us. <laughs> to the glory of no God. No one wants to miss that. <laughs> uh, and then there's also a three-day um, forensic camp that focuses just on forensics and a three-day Teach Me Automation camp, which is about... Um, Robotics, uh, robotics and, and, mm-hmm. and things like that. So um, creationmuseum.org slash camp is the place to go to learn more about Explore Camp and to register your kids uh, for that this summer. So I definitely encourage you to check that out. All right, so our first news item here, this one, I laughed so hard over this. This is our fluff item, this our fun great. piece. It really was. This is great. So this really happened. South Carolina brought in a Chick-fil-A manager to direct a COVID-19 vaccine drive through ex- after experiencing backups. So a computer glitch <laughs> a- at this um, vaccine site in South Carolina caused big wait times. Obviously, people are getting frustrated. What are they going to do? Well, when you've got a problem with your drive through line, you call in Chick-fil-A because no, they've right. got it down. I, they do this have is it another down. one that the Babylon Bee actually predicted. <laughs> yes, in, yes. In satirical form, they said they should get the... Uh, the crews from Chick-fil-A to run the, the COVID vaccination lines. I guess the mayor of this town saw that article and was like, that's so actually brilliant. <laughs> that's a really good idea, right? <laughs> and so the, the Chick-fil-A manager came in and apparently he could quickly got everything going and running and it went much more smoothly after that. So. Now, of course, my question is, did all the people giving the vaccines after they got the training from the manager, did they respond with my pleasure to everything <laughs> someone said to them? Or did the people have a craving for chicken sandwiches? <laughs> chicken sandwiches. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They probably drove right over to the Chick-fil-A because that's what I would do if I was there. 
I love the last line of this article that says, I wonder if de Blasio is planning on giving them a call as well. I don't think so. A little bit of background to that, but yeah, I don't think so. Probably not. (laughs) That's pretty, I thought that one was pretty great. All right, so this next one, ready for the cuteness factor on the next one. Baby Tyrannosaur dinosaurs were the size of a border collie. And they were Aww. all cute and fuzzy. And they were fuzzy. Like that one in the For picture, some right? reason, even though there's no fossil evidence that they yeah. were fuzzy because all they found was a little bit of a jaw and Wait, a claw. Wait, you mean that's not but an actual picture? But they put them with a bunch of fuzz on them, which yeah. is really cute, but probably not accurate to right. what the Tyrannosaurus looked like. <laughs> uh, so this is a study looking at the remains, like I said, a tiny bit of a jaw and a claw of a Tyrannosaurus, not Tyrannosaurus rex, but... A, co- a cousin, as they say, so in the same kind as Tyrannosaurus rex. And they're estimating, based on those fragments, that the baby was probably about the size of a border collie when they hatched um, from their eggs. And they say in the article, when they took their first steps, which I thought was a really funny way of describing it. Well, you've <laughs> got to spice those things up a little bit. Yeah. But, so basically, we can, we can agree with the scientific um, extrapolation here. So we're taking a piece of the jawbone and one of the claws and then saying, if we were to stretch that out over the whole body, how big would this body mm-hmm. be? And we can probably do some reasonable reconstructions around those types of things. And then think about the size of the egg and how, how big they would have been as mm-hmm. they were like, born and coming out of the egg. Size. Think about a, a, big, a rugby ball, something sure. big like that. And they're, yeah. they're going to hatch out of that, walk around. How big are they? Interesting things to think about. But mm-hmm. there's a lot of things happening in this uh, in this story that aren't really <laughs> things we can actually know based on the fossil evidence we have, specifically right. the fuzzy feathers we see on the image right. there. Right, yeah. And yeah. we know that all dinosaurs did start off small because mm-hmm. they hatched from eggs. And eggs don't get about, like you said, the size of a rugby football. Because the bigger the, the egg is, the thicker the shell's got to be to support its own weight. But the shell can't get too thick because then oxygen can't get through to keep the creature alive. Right. So the yeah. max size for an egg is about that big. And we got a T-Rex egg in our display case mm-hmm. upstairs, and it's about that big. So all dinosaurs started off small by comparison to what they formed to be later adults. But this would be a good example of you don't want this as a pet. If you get a, if you get a Tyrannosaurus as your pet, that's a bad idea because, yes, they start off this big, but Border in a few years, side, they but... eat you, all right? <laughs> yeah, and it also reminds us of a lot of people, you know, wonder how could no fit dinosaurs on the ark. Well, this, they didn't start out massive. Even the, Most of them weren't that large anyway, but even the really large ones started out relatively small. So he could have yep. taken smaller juveniles on the ark. And we have some signs at the ark encounter that talk about that if you visit yep. the life-size Noah's ark, um, uh, which is definitely something you should do, arkencounter.com. This place to go to learn about that. Um, but this next one, okay, might give you nightmares. I'm going to just warn you in <laughs> advance, so okay? Cool. I think it's I just it. cool. Yeah, if you're like it. Roger, this is cool. Uh, if, yeah. but you know, okay, I'll just let you see. I'm it. with Roger. Scientists discover bizarre new mode of snake locomotion. Nothing I've ever seen compares to it. Mm-hmm. So let's see the video here. This is a snake climbing up a pole, a relatively like a lasso. Smooth pole. It's called so lasso this is locomotion. Sped up five times, so it, yeah. it isn't quite that fast in real life, obviously. Um, but this is looking at the highly invasive species of the brown tree snake, which is invasive in Guam, and it's basically decimated the bird populations there, which is not great for the health of the ecosystem because birds are involved with transporting seeds, things like that, um, to help the forests be, um, you know, uh, um, continue, continue populating. Yeah. Yeah. They've got to be able to spread those seeds. So Mm -hmm. we know about the four basic types of locomotion. You might see a sidewinder and the hot sands and the the motion where they'll contract their stomach muscles and then the concertina motion where they can climb between branches and then uh, pulling themselves along the ground with different objects. So those are the basic four modes of locomotion that we think about. This one is very cool because it actually allows this snake to climb up very smooth trunked trees. Mm that it maybe think like a, a bamboo stock. And so these birds that are nesting in these types of trees, they presumed they'd be safe for most snakes. Right. But this snake has this uh, ability. We don't know whether this is something they do in their native or if this is an adaptation they've come to here, but they do this and they're able to climb up. They basically wrap their body around like a lasso. And you think about uh, pole climbing where you would make a hitch and you'd, you'd move it up the tree and then pull yourself up and move it up the tree. They're basically doing that over and over. And it takes a little bit of time and it, they have to stop and rest because it's a tiring motion compared to the others, but it gets them a meal at the yeah. end of this. Pretty, mm-hmm. pretty uh, significant Unfortunately meal. for the birds. <laughs> 
<laughs> so they're hoping now that they've discovered this, they can design some bird nesting sites, um, artificial nesting sites, where the snakes aren't able to climb up to eat the poor birds because yeah. they so the previous keep baffles alive. and things like you might have squirrel baffles around your sure. bird feeder and things haven't worked. They've and they were like, why? How, why aren't they working? And then they <laughs> saw this video, and the scientists said they watched it like 15 times because they couldn't believe what they were seeing. Um, the one researcher was like, I've been studying snake locomotion for 40 years, and we had no idea they could do this. So um, just a really interesting example of the complexity of, of nature and, and creation. And that's what I think is really so cool about this. I mean, we're all familiar with snakes and studying them for a very long time, yet we found out something really brand new to us. Mm -hmm. How cool is that, that God's creation can give us so much if we look and keep looking at it. And it just shows how awesome our God is, even the creation of how snakes move, whether you like them or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so this next one comes from Fox News. PETA mocked on social media for claiming insults like pig, chicken, hurt animals. So PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, posted on... Wait, I thought that was People for the Eating of Tasty Animals. Different we're, 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 part, we're part of that club, <laughs> okay. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's Roger's group. <laughs> um, <laughs> so they, they recently put a post out on social media saying that words can create a more inclusive world or perpetrate oppression. Calling someone an animal as an insult reinforces the myth that humans are superior to other animals and justified in violating them. Stand up for justice by rejecting supremacist language. Yeah, so if I were to call Brian a chauvinist pig, that would be an insult to pigs, not an uh, insult to Brian. Obviously. <laughs> an insult to pigs. <laughs> because we, we recognize certain characteristics in animals, and then we take those and we, we use those as sometimes as slurs and insults for people, sometimes as beneficial ways to talk about people. Sure. Mm -hmm. and, and we even see this type of language used in the Bible. You think mm -hmm. of uh, Herod is referred to as a fox because he's wily and conniving and, and tries to do these things. Uh, we mm -hmm. see all kinds of examples of that type of well, language. Jesus called the Pharisees a, a brood of a vipers. A brood of vipers, vipers right? right? Mm -hmm. Jesus and John both called them that. And so we see these comparisons in the Bible. So we know that there's nothing sinful per se in using them. Mm -hmm. right. We should use them appropriately, not as just attacking the person, right, yeah. but calling them to, to account for their sin and those types mm -hmm. of things. But here you have a worldview that values animals more than it values humans because they don't have that foundation in scripture mm -hmm. that animals are a different type of creation. Right. We're special, mm -hmm. aren't we, Brian? Well, in the biblical worldview, like, it really articulates that fundamental point that we alone mm -hmm. as humans are made in God's image. So yes, we do have more value than a fox or a worm. Now, should we value God's creation? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the Bible tells us to, mm -hmm. right? So we've got a reason to do so. But we recognize as we do value God's creation, we esteem mankind way above creation because we're made in the image mm -hmm. of God and have eternal souls. And so there's a distinct reason in the biblical world of you to value humans over animals. I, I tell you, one of my favorite things about this article was the very first line, someone's response to PETA, you know, being mad about people using those words in, in a negative way in their mind. This person said, I can't tell if this is real or you guys are making fun of yourselves. I honestly, when I just saw the little <laughs> graphic, <laughs> like, I thought, oh, it's a Babylon Bee article. I know. It was I mean, PETA. It's I saw actual it real. It's actually because real. Because if the animals are equal to us, then shouldn't they just be defending themselves? I mean... Well, that would make sense if we were going to be consistent. But, right. Brian, you're acting as an oppressor. Obviously. You've got to recognize that they don't have a voice for themselves, so we have to stand up stand for Stand up them. for justice. By rejecting the supremacy. I, I can't even recognize it because I'm born this way and blind to it in that secular worldview. So, yeah. it really, I mean, just the fact that they, they say it's a myth that humans are superior to other animals right in that just that little phrase you see there the evolutionary underpinnings of their worldview humans are just animals we're no different from the other animals we're not superior in any way which is totally different from the biblical worldview which humans are, in, are not anim, not just animals you know we're, we're distinct we're different because we're made in the very image of god we can you admit see that, that very... birds fly better than we do i'm i'm cool with that but that yeah. doesn't mean yeah because i talked later in the article about qualities. like yeah. about that yeah and, and one just one other quick note in the secular worldview why in the world care about animals period mm -hmm. In the ocean worldview, why care about pigs, their feelings, or the feelings of a bird? I mean, mm -hmm. they're just evolved pond scum as well. If we mm -hmm. can rule over them, if might mates right, which is the evolution worldview in a nutshell, the of the why not oppress them in physical terms and whether using words? It, why does it matter in their worldview? You see what they're doing, and this happens all the time. They're borrowing a biblical principle, care for creation, but pulling it out of context and trying to apply it in their worldview because in mm -hmm. their worldview, they have no consistent reason for the value mm -hmm. that they adore. 
I got a joke for you to wrap up this story. Oh, here we so go. Brian Windu, a cow, a pig, and a chicken all make the same sound. I don't know. When you throw them on the grill. <laughs> Wait, I got one more. What do you call a cow with two legs? Lean beef. Lean beef. Oh, <laughs> oh my word. That's one of my son's favorite jokes. Oh, we are going to move go, on buddy. to the next article now. We really go quickly. quickly here. This Me is, Roger this could is be devolving here for hours. really fast. Okay. <laughs> New scientist. <laughs> um, our dexterous thumbs have a two million year old origin. So these thumbs here, two million years old. So this Look was um, looking at an analysis of um, this particular muscle here. You can see mm -hmm. the picture there. Um, and trying to figure out, okay, when in the evolution of humans, when did this particular muscle give us our ability to, you know, grip and have torque grab and things like that, so we could things. use tools. Mm -hmm. um, and shockingly, they found out that Australopithecus, which is an, an ape, ape, doesn't have that ability, but the human groups do. It's shocking. No yeah, one so, could have predicted yeah, that. So they looked at these different fossils. Uh, we, can, we can look at the fossils, even if those tissues aren't preserved. We can look at the, the way that the bones connect and the insertion and origin points of those mm -hmm. tendons that would be connected to the muscles. So if you think Maybe about it, you modeling. put your finger right here under your thumb and you squeeze, you can feel that muscle. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at that muscle and that allows us to move our thumb across and grip things that we can manipulate. Okay? And if an ape's thumb is way out at an angle like this, and the muscle is smaller, and it moves across, not up at an angle, it can't grab things as tightly. It can't create as much torque. So they did this modeling, mm -hmm. uh, 3D modeling, and then ran it through a computer simulation. And we can see the effects of that angle and the size of the muscle that would, that would have on their ability to grab these things. And that makes sense for us looking at these fossils. All the fossils that are Homo, the group that humans belong to, they, they lump a couple in here we would say are probably apes like Homo naledi and others. But these Homo fossils, Homo neanderthalensis and the others mm -hmm. that we think of as human-like are gonna have thumbs just like us. And that's what we've said Shocking. as a biblical creationist <laughs> perspective. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between those that we would call the apes, the ape kind and the human kind because God made us that way. Mm -hmm. And even though there are some similarities in the general structure, the differences are dynamic. I mean, you think mm -hmm. about what our hands can do, what God has created them to do. They're overly designed. Like we can literally, you can hold a hammer with these three fingers, but then hold a feather with these two. You can do something with power and force and something with such sensitivity and a light touch at the same time. You know, we can use a hammer, but we can write with a pencil. We can draw. I mean, we have such fine-tuned mm -hmm. dexterity with our hands that is so different from the apes because we are distinct from them. Mm -hmm. And, you and see they've been designed to do ways. well what God designed them to do. I can't swing on branches like they can. Right, exactly. I can't exactly. For as long they're both designed far, very so well very different. for yeah. what they're supposed to do. All right, this next one comes from LifeSite News. Biden restores foreign aid to abortion by repealing the Mexico City policy. So the Mexico City policy basically meant that um, organizations involved in abortion weren't able to receive U.S. funds um, in, in countries around the world. And Biden has since um, repealed that, allowing that money to go to different groups that do do abortions. Yeah, and this um, has basically been a Republican-Democrat hot potato yeah, back sure. and forth. Mm -hmm. So when there's a Democrat in office, the president will repeal that restriction and they'll allow these funds to be used for reproductive health issues around the world. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know that abortions are included in that little euphemism. Right, nice and, way to uh, dress up killing yeah. of unborn children. When, they, when a Republican comes into office, they reverse that and restrict those funds. Mm -hmm. So this is one of those issues that goes back and forth every election cycle as, as a new president comes in. Are they going to uphold this or are they going to repeal yeah. this? Mm -hmm. Elections we know have consequences, and, mm -hmm. and and Joe Biden I think has said, or at least those around him, that he will be the most pro-abortion president. He wouldn't word it like that. that pro, of him and, he would and use Harris, their word yeah. in reproductive health care. Mm -hmm. Reproductive rights and but reproductive health care. Within yeah. his first couple of weeks of office, I think he signed around three dozen executive orders, and some of those have really been attacking uh, the unborn and mm -hmm. leading to the propagation mm -hmm. of abortion, which is leading to more and more babies being murdered in their mother's womb because elections have consequences and people vote according to their worldview and worldview mm -hmm. has consequences. And Deadly I dare say there are many, many professing Christians, even Joe Biden himself, who professes some version of Christianity that mm -hmm. don't have a true Christian biblical worldview. Mm -hmm. 
Because right. we take everyone's worldview and we hold it up to the light of Scripture. And That's when right. you, you hold this up to Scripture, you see it doesn't matter what the Scripture teaches. It scripture doesn't. teaches we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are persons from the very moment of fertilization. Um, so abortion is the taking of a human life. It is murder. Um, that's what a biblical worldview says. So in these people who claim that they're believers, you, you take what they say and you hold it up against the light of scripture and it, it doesn't match. And we can say, no, that is an utterly unbiblical belief. You need to get your thinking in line with what the word of God teaches because it is the ultimate standard, not your opinion and not what you think yeah. about these particular issues. That's right. Many of these sources that come to us in the pro-life news groups are going to be from a pretty Roman Catholic uh, perspective because mm -hmm. that's the main funding that comes for a lot of these groups and the main people who are involved. And we recognize here in this story some of the uh, contradictions that are drawn out. Uh, President Biden claims to be a Roman Catholic, but mm -hmm. there are bishops within the Roman Catholic Church and others who have said, this doesn't make sense. If you say you're following the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, then why would you be promoting abortion right. and saying you're going to expand those opportunities for everyone, not only in our country, but then give our money to other countries to pay for those types of services. Mm -hmm. And it really brought to mind James 2 to think about the way President Biden is acting in these things. He claims that he has faith in the God of the Bible. And James says that if we have faith, it'll be demonstrated in our works. Mm -hmm. And his works are clearly evil in this situation where right. he's mm -hmm. promoting the murder of babies. And so I can't look at him and say, yes, he must be a believer because his fruit is not mm -hmm. bearing those things out. And read through James 2 and think about how those things fit together in light of the actions that he's portraying on this mm -hmm. issue. And, and speaking of that, the next article here is New York Times ripped for labeling Biden most religiously observant president in 50 years. Um, so people have kind of pointed out, well, <laughs> what about some of the other presidents before him? <laughs> um, but just this, this idea there that um, he is, you know, very religiously observant. But again, pointing that back to we need to take whatever people, what they say, what they do, and hold it up to the light of scripture and see, does it mass, match with what scripture teaches? And we also have to keep in mind yeah. Every single person is religious, whether they hold to whether you know whether they claim to be a Christian or or an atheist. They're still religious. It's just what religion do they hold to? Is it religion of atheism, of humanism? Is it their own version of Christianity, where they've invented a god in their own image, essentially? Um, you know, what is it? Every person has a religion. Every person is very religiously observant. Just what religion is it that they hold to? And he's not even a consistent Catholic. Mm -mm, right, as no. you just pointed out earlier, uh, which is very intriguing. And, it, and it's also, you can see the bias of those who are reporting on this because mm -hmm. when the New York Times said this, obviously they're pushing it as a good thing. Hey, look, guys, Joe Biden is very religious, therefore he likes God and he's not that bad and you should like him too. It's kind of the general idea. And they, and they present this religiosity as a good thing. But not too long ago, and just to give an example of Supreme Court Justice mm -hmm. Amy Coney Barrett, mm -hmm. right? When they were going through, you know, appointing her, she was getting attacked from attacked from everywhere because of her Catholic faith and that she held to actually these. She would actually views live out the things right. that she of believed. The yeah. They were afraid that right? that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so it's very inconsistent. They actually called her unfit for duty because she held to her faith. And what you really see is the bias of those who are reporting this. Mm -hmm. And we've got to realize that those who report these articles, they're not neutral. Mm -hmm. There's a mm -hmm. bias. Often you can see the bias even in just the headline of the article. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. If you'd like a resource that would help you think through some of these issues as you're trying to interact with people, maybe in your family or your community who are uh, pro-abortion or think of these things mm -hmm. as basic human reproductive rights, we've got a video series that was produced by uh, our buddy Todd Friel over at Wretched, a great ministry partner, yep. and it's called Life is Best. And along with that, we've got a series of DVDs based around the issue mm -hmm. of life, uh, stem cells and cloning and abortion and those types of things. Great resource that helps you think through some of those things and be able to present clear biblical arguments for why this is, this is not an expression of Christian faith in any sense. Right. And mm -hmm. the fact that God's created all of these little ones in his image and we need to be honoring and respecting God and protecting that life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This next one here comes from Science Daily. Butterfly wing clap explains mystery of flight. So if you've ever seen 
Not that kind of <laughs> Not that one. Different, different kind of clap. It's a little quieter. <laughs> if you've ever seen, obviously, butterfly fluttering around, um, they fly differently than other creatures that are able to fly. And so it's been kind of a bit of a mystery how they're able to do this um, since they have such large, broad wings relative to their very tiny body size. And scientists assumed, um, based on that, it's very inefficient. It works, mm -hmm. but it's, it's not efficient. Um, you know, they're, they're kind of able to fly. And you think, I mean, you think about that, then you think about monarchs that are able to fly, like from Canada to Mexico. It's like, they have to be efficient flyers. But anyway, they did this study where they put butterflies in wind tunnels and observed them in flight taking off. And they realized that the butterfly's wings clap up together and it actually creates an air pocket. And that when the wings collide, the air is forced out, which creates a backward jet that propels the butterfly. And it's extremely efficient. Now, I remember the <laughs> same type of thinking about bumblebees. Mm -hmm. The yeah. scientists said, well, bumblebees shouldn't be able to fly. How does this work? And when we think about the way God has created all these different things, the evolutionists think flight in insects evolved at least six different times independently in these different groups. But I would see that and say God has created these things with amazing mm -hmm. variety and the ability to design those different creatures that this butterfly can take off and escape predators very quickly by creating this little pocket and that little jet of air is an amazing design feature. Mm -hmm. Not something that I would expect to happen randomly by accident as these mm -hmm. mutations accumulate over millions of years. They actually say this in the article that now that they realize how it actually works and it's very functional and it's actually elegant, they said the way the butterfly flies is an elegant mechanism that is far more advanced than we imagined and it is fascinating. It literally blew their minds. And again, mm -hmm. this is where your assumptions will drive your conclusions. Mm -hmm. If you assume this mechanism for flight just evolved over time, then maybe it's not very efficient. If you start from a biblical perspective, there's an all-knowing, wise creator, God, who knows what he's doing. Maybe we could find something there and try to emulate it, which is now what they're trying to yeah, do. Yeah, now they're like, oh, we with, can use technology to make drones. Yeah. This is amazing, yeah. But so rather than glorifying world, yeah. God, they're seeking mm -hmm. to glorify random chance processes over right. millions of years. Mm -hmm. uh, so this next one here also comes from Science Daily. The aroma of distant worlds. New evidence that spices, fruits from Asia had reached the Mediterranean earlier than thought. So basically, Abraham might have eaten bananas. That's, a pretty That's what interesting I got from this thought. article. So this is I like talking, bananas. Yeah, um, they were good. looking at teeth, and they're able to, there's new technology, and we've seen a lot of articles that have talked about this, looking at um, teeth and analyzing different fragments that are on teeth that are kind of mm -hmm. stuck in there, and being able to figure out diets in the past based mm -hmm. on what remains on the teeth. And when they looked at these different individuals from the Mediterranean, they realized they found banana fragments, they found turmeric, and they found um, soy, and different things like that, uh, that men there must have been they trade going have on. Been there. Yeah. They shouldn't be there. So there must have been this trade going on way earlier than they thought, which in a biblical worldview, I mean, this makes sense in light of Babel, in light of uh, just uh, the biblical history and how humans have always been intelligent. Much more connected than we thought. Much more connected right. than we think. Mm -hmm. So even if you can't do calculus, your teeth can. And that little layer of tartar that we <laughs> think of that builds up is called calculus. And if we examine that from some old, uh, either fossilized or human remains from this time period, we can actually examine that and find the protein structures that are in there and link that back to certain foods. So that's how they've been able to determine that bananas and turmeric and other things have been part of the diet of these individuals. Now we can't say for certain that they ate it in that area. They could have eaten it somewhere else and then moved to that area. Mm -hmm. But at some point in this individual's life, they've eaten this food and it's been caught in that calculus. Now that's not gonna work so well for people who are studying our remains in years to come <laughs> because we usually get that scraped off at the dentist every six months or every year. So you going to the dentist is ruining future archeology. span yes, That's the is. takeaway so from the this. So the moral of the story the is don't brush your teeth, help archeologists in the future. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Kids, Children, don't kids listen, listen to Brian. To Brian. <laughs> I know. Son, don't disregard that. Macy, don't listen to that. <laughs> yes. uh, all right. The next one here comes from CBC. Giant predatory worms, ancient fossil burrows discovered. Uh, so this is looking at um, what are called trace fossils, which are when footprints or burrows, things like that are preserved rather than the creature itself. Um, so they found these trace fossils of these giant um, tunnels, layers, basically, where these um, bobbit worms used to live. 
live, which are these crazy, huge, oh my scary looking creatures. If you want a nightmare, go look for Man. a picture. Yeah, of if you're well, a you bitch, this, this right is definitely there. the stuff of nightmares. They they hide in these burrows and they're like they're as long as humans. Like they're well, I don't know about yeah. your well, size or my size humans. Maybe closer to my size human. Yeah. And they come up out of the burrow, grab a fish or something, back down. And, and you it's see like the jaws out to the side and they come in a scissor motion, correct? Yeah. Ugh. yeah. So yeah, thankfully they're not big enough to hurt humans, but poor fish. Um, but yeah, so they found these these burrows, and shockingly, despite the fact that they believe these burrows are 20 million years old, and they believe bobbit worms have existed for 400 million years, they're, the burrows are the same as the burrows they make today. Mm -hmm. Shockingly similar. And they're basically unchanged for 400 million years in their yeah. morphology, right? Same basic yeah. body so structure. We see that that idea of evolution being able to explain no change or lots of change in yeah. that plasticity. Mm -hmm. So thinking through some of these, these fossil evidences, and we can agree that these are amazing finds, and we can agree with the interpretation of these tunnels. They kind of make an L-shaped tunnel, and it matches up with what we see today. It's very mm -hmm. reasonable to conclude that these were similar to the creatures that we have living today, maybe a little bit larger and living in different sediments. But the areas that they're looking at, say, they say this is off the coast where this would have been a, a sea 400 million years ago. It would have been a coastline similar to what we see around Taiwan today. And so they're uh, trying to analyze those things from that long age evolutionary perspective. But as far as the interpretations go, that these are tunnels left by these creatures, we can agree with that. It's the time scale that right. we probably right. yes. disagree with when mm -hmm. we look at these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just another good example of something cool in creation that we're looking at, if not fearsome, right? And looking at the flood sediments and, and, and it, just, reminders of the flood. As we say all the time, if you start with the wrong assumptions, the wrong mm -hmm. worldview, you likely get the wrong conclusions. And separating the fact from the real observations to their interpretations, that's a key in all of this, whether we're talking about origins, biology, or even morality, separating what we observe from your interpretations and your worldview. Mm -hmm. All right, well, that's all the time that we have for today, but we will be back next time, so please join us, uh, and God bless. See ya.